Thanks to all of you for joining us today for our first ever Inspirational Collisions event. This hopefully is an ongoing series, um, and it's really grown out of a need to tell the real stories of entrepreneurship in Rochester. It's a space and time to hear from entrepreneurs themselves and understand how and why they're growing a business here in Rochester, what barriers they faced along the way, and how they've navigated these roadblocks. Be sure you stick around until the very end of the webinar uh, today. We always try and create meaningful events, and I know that a lot of us joining here today and listening in are entrepreneurs, and our time is of extreme value. Your time is of extreme value, and we want to make sure that we're using this time in a meaningful way. So not only do we want to share with you um, some inspiration, capital, stories of entrepreneurship, but we also want to leave you with something very tangible, something that you can take away and apply to your personal or professional so stay tuned until the very end of today's webinar uh, for that. So some housekeeping items before we get started today. Uh, my name is Amanda Leitner. I'm the Director of Communications at Collider. Collider is a Rochester-based 501c3 nonprofit that serves Rochester entrepreneurs through events, education, space, and storytelling. So we're very honored to be joined today by Lena Prodden Namstick for this very first Inspirational Collisions event. Um, I met Lena last fall when she very first moved to Rochester with her family from the Boston area, which she'll share more about that with you today. Um, she's really been just a wonderful person to get to know. She really dove head first into the community um, when she got here to understand the ecosystem, understand what it had to offer, figure out where she fit in, um, and, under, and she took the time to understand how she could help the ecosystem along its way. Um, so I'm glad our paths have crossed many times since we met last fall. Um, and I think we met during Entrepreneurship Week, actually. So it was, it was kind of a, yeah, a great time to, to be um, in this space. So a little bit about Lena. Um, she is CEO and president, president of Konomics. She grew up on the outskirts of Mumbai, India, and came to the U.S. to pursue a PhD in pharmacology from Tulane University. She's an accomplished life science professional and faculty member of Harvard Medical School, and she has extensive experience in developing alliances between industry and academia, academia and spearheading multidisciplinary projects in the fields of diabetes, cardiovascular, and allied areas. She also has an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management from their executive MBA program. She has translated all this expertise into the founding of Konomics. Konomics uses cutting edge omics science, machine learning, and bioinformatics to help customers create an evidence based pipeline of dietary supplements and functional foods. Konomics has created a new standard for benchmarking and the, effective, uh, the effect of active ingredients used in dietary supplements and functional foods and drinks. So, Lena moved to Rochester uh, last summer in August of 2019 along with her husband and son. And she immediately fell in love with Rochester and its entrepreneurial ecosystem and is now in the midst of moving economics operations to Rochester. We're very honored to have Lena jump in and be the first person in this new series. And uh, we're very grateful as well to each of you listening in here today um, and spending an hour of your time with us this afternoon. Um, I know that all of you listening in could be doing anything else with your time. So thanks for choosing to be here with us. Um, and we wanna make sure that this time is tailored to you as well, the people listening in. So um, in case you have not realized this yet or you're new, new to Zoom or new to Zoom webinars, um, if you're joining as um, a listener, we won't be able to see you, we won't be able to hear you, we can just see and hear the panelists. So unless you're um, myself, Lena, or Jamie Sonsbach, um, no one will be able to see you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, Jamie, you can just see him as a logo and he's kind of controlling the tech behind the scene. But we still want each of you to participate. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of you, everybody listening in right now to go down to the bottom of their um, Zoom panel and open the question and answer um, button or press it. I don't know what you would call it, but open that up. Um, and I wanna encourage each of you or challenge each of you to ask a question to Lena starting now um, and Lena's going to talk for about 15 to 20, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to open up the space to your questions and answers. Um, so be sure to, to write them in as we're going. And like I said, 
um, I really challenge each of you to think of, think of just one question to ask her. Um, you also have the opportunity to kind of upvote questions. So if you type a question in, um, or I'm sorry, if you have a question similar to someone else um, that typed one in, or you think it's really important question, you can, you should be able to give it a thumbs up and it'll kind of bump it up to the top of the queue um, to get your question answered. So our webinar today is a pilot, but we'd like to keep this going, uh, perhaps on a monthly basis. Um, and we also want to ask you, uh, the people listening in, who you want to hear from. So if there's a Rochester entrepreneur that you think would be a great guest for a next Inspirational Collisions, let us know. Um, the best way might be just to email us at hello at collider.mn, or you can email me and Amanda at collider.mn, um, or interact with us in any way on social media, um, however, and let us know who you want to hear from. Some final things before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and it's also being live streamed on, the, on Facebook, on the Collider Facebook page. Um, so if people are listening in there, you can, on Facebook, you can certainly ask your questions there, but we'll um, be mainly focusing on questions in the Zoom webinar. And you can still join in on the Zoom webinar if you're listening in on Facebook. So you can do that as well. Um, so this, Besides listening in today, this will also be uh, shared as a video on the Collider YouTube page, as well as a podcast on the Rochester Rising podcast. So you have multiple opportunities to listen in, listen again, which I'm sure you'll all want to do. Um, so yeah, I think we will jump in then. But again, keep your question and answer tab open and start typing in your questions. So all right. Well, Lena, we'll go over to you. Thanks so much for being here today, first of all. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you, Jamie, uh, for inviting me for organizing this first webinar. I'm really proud and really humbled to be here. And thank you for all the attendees. Uh, feel free to ask any question. Um, I'm happy to answer all your questions and even connect with you afterwards. So don't, you know, uh, yeah, take your time if you, you know, if you have to ask any questions later on after the podcast. So we touched a little bit on what Konomics was, but I'd like to start just by asking you, um, what is Konomics? If you can share more about the company and your mission with us. Yeah, so at Konomics, um, we really want to make food as medicine a reality. That's our, that's our mission and our values support that mission. So our values are about truth, trust, and transparency. And um, you may know this, but um, a lot of the dietary supplement functional food industry, um, the products that are developed, um, a lot of them are really good products, but oftentimes uh, very little science gets used in the product development as well as uh, in the ingredient development. And what we are trying to do at Economics is to bring cutting edge science, uh, such as uh, genomics and bioinformatics, and help companies in the space develop uh, products using um, you know, latest scientific technologies. And what I mean by that is we have uh, accumulated a lot of data around how do these products, um, including just single ingredients, how do they affect uh, human genes and thereby how do they affect human wellness. So we've, we've acknowledged, uh, we have uh, accumulated a lot of knowledge around that. And then we developed algorithms around, can we develop recipes based on our algorithms? Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, if you, if you have a recipe, if your mom gives you a recipe and if you, you know, uh, buy the ingredients from you know, a corner store versus like a fancy store, your product, your end product is only going to be as good as the ingredients you use. And that's what we realized in this, um, in this space is that it's not just what your formulation recipe is, but it is also important to have in ingredients that are really good quality. And so we can certify and test the ingredients at the level of how they affect human genes. So no other company is really providing this kind of in-depth understanding about the ingredients that get used. What we really want to do is again, uh, provide all kinds of R&D and uh, so latest technologies based R&D to the industry. And we are working with uh, several different companies. A lot of times I get asked, do we provide uh, services or do we make our own products and sell it to the customers? We are not doing that. Our goal right now is to really work with other companies and um, create new standards in uh, testing as well as new standards in product development. 
So that's what we're doing with economics. So like we talked about in the beginning, you know, you started this, you started Konomics in the Boston area, and you're in the process of moving it to Rochester. So what has that journey like been like to, to build upon your momentum here in Rochester to move your operations from um, the Boston area to Rochester? Um, and what barriers did you face during this process and how did you or did you not um, overcome those? Yeah, so, um as you mentioned in the intro, I moved to Rochester um, with my husband, who's a consultant at Mayo. And right when we were making that decision for our family, uh, I also had to have a conversation with my co-founders. And our company is based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, uh, we are three co-founders. And as an entrepreneur, um, you know, you, that's, that's your family um, outside of your immediate family, outside of your uh, real family. So I had to take um, my two co-founders in confidence and we had a conversation around, hey, you know, if I move, e there were two options, either we move the company with me um, or, we, um, or we find somebody else to run the company in, in Massachusetts. Uh, my two other co-founders are, are very much involved, but they're more on the strategic or more on the scientific side of things, economics. I'm the one who's really running the company and all the operations. So they didn't even blink about it. They said, wherever you are, the company should be based there. And so it was, it was, you know, in that sense, a very easy decision. But then I had to make sure on the other end in Rochester that there was support, there was, you know, um, there were resources available uh, right from, you know, the ecosystem to, you know, my CPA will, had to get involved to ask about taxes, et cetera. So all these things that you have to um, you know, put a check mark on, but from, from an entrepreneurial perspective, the most important thing for me was a supportive network. As an entrepreneur, it can be very lonely. Um, you know, a lot of times you don't know, unless you're like a serial entrepreneur and on your fifth company, but even then it is hard because every company is different and you're an entrepreneur, that means you're solving a problem that most likely people haven't you know, able to either solve it or you're trying to solve it in a different way. And so you know, there's not much that you can look up to to say, oh, you know, this person did it this way, so possibly it will work for me. Especially something like what we are doing is very different than what has been done before. So I had to look into not only resources and networks and um, other entrepreneurs, they don't necessarily have to be in your space, but you know, there are some challenges that are common to all entrepreneurs. Um, talent, uh, can, would we, if we grow our company here, would, be, would we be able to hire the right type of people? So all these things, we ha I literally had to make an Excel sheet as to what, you know, what, and prioritize them. Okay, maybe for this, we can still outsource and go outside of Rochester, or for this, we can, you know, look somewhere else, but there are some fundamental things for a company um, that you absolutely need to have. One is uh, support from the overall ecosystem, but also able to hire people. And, and it, there may not be people available, but would people be moving in? And it was sort of perfect timing, right? DMC is getting big. Everybody now knows about DMC, and there is a lot of this momentum right now in Rochester. And uh, a company that is um, not coming from Mayo um, is kind of, you know, it's new. And, but having said that, I have had um, meetings with people from the Mayo, even they have been supportive, irrespective of the fact that my company is, was not incubated from Mayo. And so all these um, important um, points on my Excel sheet had to be checked off. Um, and so that's how we made the decision whether we are, and again, we had about 16, 17 months to prepare for that. So my husband was getting recruited, I think starting October of 2017, and we didn't move here until uh, end of July of last year. So that, and then how has it been since we have moved here? One thing that I did uh, and I was proactive about was to really attend as many events as possible and to network as much as possible. And um, so I think starting right away, starting in September, I think I attended one of the first uh, medical alley events, uh, or maybe it was even August, uh, the very first month that we moved here. 
and I'm, I made connections there and some of the people I met there are still friends with me and are still helping me out. And so I think it's really important to get outside of comfort zone and go meet people and not just the same kind of people, not just people from your own background, but also people from other, other uh, backgrounds and other industries. So that for sure. And then uh, in Rochester, I met you, Amanda, and that has been extremely helpful. And Amanda, will, I remember one day we were sitting at Cafe Steam and you said, oh, you should meet this person. I think this will be really important. And as soon as we were done, Amanda was like, hey, you know, this is, you know, this is Lena. I just met her. But by the way, I'm introducing you to you, her to you now. And I think that's, um, that has been, I've been completely uh, taken by surprise. I mean, how much there is enthusiasm around uh, entrepreneurship and how much people have been helpful. Um, when I moved here uh, through, the, through my husband's Mayo connections and through the Mayo office um, of the uh, uh, tech venture office, I was introduced to Chris Shad of DMC and he connected me to a lot of people, including Tracy, uh, who I can see she's, uh, she's attending this uh, webinar right now. So, you know, and then through Tracy, I met other people. So I think that is, it's been phenomenal uh, networking and meeting other people. And I think every entrepreneur, irrespective of if they're within their own ecosystem and have been there, there for five or 10 years, I think that is the most important thing. And that's what I'm, that is what has been important for me in Rochester as well. Awesome. So, we have one more question before we open it up to question q and a i know there are people listening and no one has typed a question in yet so everyone think of a question to write to lena or to type to lena um but my final question for you before we open it up to the audience is you know you could be doing anything else um what motivates you to be an entrepreneur why follow this path um rather than any other you could have chosen so I, as you know, as, as you introduced me, I am um, still faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm part-time there, but um, you know, I, I was on a different path. And uh, while I was you know, doing my teaching and my mentoring and running my lab, uh, I'm assistant professor, um, you know, one thing that always came up about me, and if you were to ask other people is, oh, you, if you want to get stuff done, go to Lena. And it didn't matter if it was, you know, related to my research or if it was related to something else, or if she doesn't know, she will, she'll make sure that she will tell you where to go. And that has always been my approach to things. Why wait for somebody else to solve a problem? Is it possible for you to solve that problem? Or maybe you can, you know, if you know someone, you can, you know, guide other people to, you know, hey, this is a problem, bring, bring it to the light, right? Oh, hey, can you solve this? And I do this all the time about everything. Like if I see a problem, I just can't, why are we not doing something about it? And that's how, you know, uh, my itch for entrepreneurship began. And I didn't have any formal training um, in business. I was a straight science uh, major and biology major and pharmacology PhD, but I did a lot of um, leadership administrative work um, uh, as a faculty member. And um, through that, you know, I learned a lot of problem solving, et cetera. And, um, I, I decided to go to business school and came across wonderful uh, people, my professors, my classmates at MIT. So that helped me a lot. And then when I was just done with my, um, with my MBA, my co-founder who's, who is a serial entrepreneur approach and said, Hey, you know, this is another idea I have. What do you think about it? And you know, that's that's the beginning of economics and my entrepreneurial journey. But having said that, I always think about even people in bigger organizations can be entrepreneurs. If you're taking on a challenge at your organization, and if you're trying to solve it, you are an entrepreneur. So don't think of yourself as, oh, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur. You don't have to have your own company. You don't have to build your own uh, business. You could be an entrepreneur just by solving uh, challenges within a bigger organization. Awesome. So now we're going to open it up to for you your questions. So again, please type them in the Q and A. Um, otherwise, we'll just ask Lena our questions. <laughs> but uh, so I encourage you all to do that. So we have one. We have a question for you, Lena. What has been? What do you feel has been your biggest challenge here in Rochester? Um, I think, so for what we do, um, 
for, for economics, we are looking for um, a wet lab space. So I, you know, my company is a life sciences company. And I think early on when we met Amanda and I think Jamie too, we talked about that, but slowly it's getting solved. I've been having multiple conversations with um, you know, uh, important stakeholders in the ecosystem about that. And hopefully soon we will have a shared wet lab space because if you want to build out a life sciences um, sort of an ecosystem here, I think that is something that you would absolutely need. Um, and so, yeah, so that has been, but I shouldn't say it's a challenge, it's an opportunity. That's how I look at it. So, you know, ho hopefully that will get resolved soon. But other than that, I really can't think of, you know, when I was moving here, everybody said, oh my God, you're moving from Boston, the, the biggest hub. And, you know, there are, it, it, for an entrepreneur, it is all about getting work done and wherever that work gets done, I think that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter, you know, where you, where that happens, as long as that work gets done, as long as you create that value, I think that's the most important thing. So you mentioned the value of kind of networking, getting involved in an ecosystem. Um, there could be some people listening in who are newer to the ecosystem, but what kind of suggestions do you have of, of ways people should look to get involved when they're newer into the community? Yeah, I think, I mean, right now we are uh, stuck in our homes or, you know, we can uh, co-mingle right now because of COVID-19. Someday this will be over, but sign up for, um, sign up for events. Like I think I met one of the attendees that I can see on the list. I met her at Nidhi uh, at uh, um, the, the cup. What is that called? Um, Jamie organizes. Um, uh, one million cups. Friend. Yes, one million cups. Sorry, I have pitched at that before in Boston too. But yes, at one million cups. And so, you know, just attend. Um, sign up for as many things as, po as possible. Again, it doesn't have to be within your industry or, you know, like I, coming from life sciences, I think the pitches I attended that day, a couple of them were not in life sciences. So it doesn't matter. Just, just make connections, go out um, and pitch. That's the other thing too, you know, go pitch. If there is an open event, just go pitch, just practice your pitch. So when you're ready now to pitch in front of your investors or uh, in front of your clients, you, all those questions have been worked out. So make sure, you know, don't miss the opportunity for networking and pitching. I see a, a lot of women in the participants. I wanted to ask you and, and people who are um, researchers and scientists, you know, what was that kind of transition like from, from having your PhD doing, you know, biomedical research as we traditionally think about it and then jumping into a startup? I think we are, you know, as PhD, as scientists, I think we have this unique personality that we develop over time where we are so used to our results failing and our experiments failing so, and getting bad reviews from, um, you know, publications that I think, you know, we, and we try to solve so many hard problems anyway. Entrepreneurship is not much different from that. You constantly get told that, oh, your idea, but you know, you constantly get challenged. Oh, but that, you know, I don't think you're going to get clients. You know, as long as you have faith in what you do and you have done your research, I think everything else follows. Um, and I think it's just keeping at it. You know, perseverance is the number one factor, you know. You get beat down, you wake up the next day and you, you know, keep doing it all over again. And then, you know, just like when you're doing your PhD or even after your PhD, you have a mentor. So mentorship is extremely, I, I didn't talk about that earlier, but um, even in Rochester, I have encountered so many phenomenal mentors. You know, keep talking, keep discussing your idea. And this whole thing about, oh, I'm going to keep this completely secret till I'm ready to, I don't think, you know, it's very hard, just like in your research, it's hard to just for somebody else to come and just start replicating your work and sort of like stealing your science. It's the same thing on, on, in entrepreneurship. As long as you have a solid idea and you have worked at it enough and you have researched it enough, you know, go talk to potential advisors, go, go get opinions of people outside of, you know, your um, community. So I think that's the most important thing. And I think that's the, the, the similarity between um, being a scientist and, you know, being an entrepreneur. It's not much, of course, you know, there, there will be things that you will be learning. And every day I learn about new things. For example, I didn't 
do financial modeling or I didn't know what the 409A valuation was. Of course, you have to learn a lot of different skills, but the, but the basis of it is still the same, just hard work, researching and not giving up, which we all do as scientists anyway. Yeah. This one's kind of a two-part question. Um, so what stage of development are you at with Konomics right now? And, you know, when you're looking to fundraise, do you find it harder to attract venture capital dollars when you're based here in the Midwest as opposed to being based in Boston? Um, so what stage are we at? So we, um, early on, we started generating revenue by providing, so we found a gap and we started monetizing that right away, which was providing scientific services to uh, natural product industry. Um, and so we started generating revenue. So we are revenue positive, but we didn't have a model which, which is uh, scalable, right? So this was more like a consulting model. And so we had to come up with something that was more scalable, that was more time efficient, money efficient, and it could be replicable, right? And so while we are providing these RN, big uh, project R&D services, um, we started, you know, learning about the industry itself. Again, all three of us co-founders come from a very clinical biotech pharma background and we were new to the industry. So we started asking a lot of questions to our existing customers, our potential customers, and really figure out what that pain point was. And everybody pointed out towards the, the quality of the ingredients. And so we started to put our, you know, scientist hats back on and said, oh, let's figure out how we can solve this problem using, again, science, because that's the basis of everything we do. And so now we have come up with this um, ingredient testing ingredient certification platform, and uh, we are about to launch that at some point this year. Um, everything has been delayed given the circumstances right now, but our first uh, launch is going to be for CBD testing. Uh, hopefully some, again, you know, uh, later in the fall or later this year, we will be doing that. Um, as far as investment, attracting investment, being a Rochester company, I think everything is so global these days. Um, I don't think that will be, or I don't think that's much of an, we've, we've been talking to nobody. I've talked to investors uh, and I've always been upfront in those 15 months that we were planning to move that so nobody blinked. Oh my God, you're going, as long as, again, as long as you create the value, as long as you, you uh, explain your story and as long as you let them know that there are resources available, I think that's not um, attracting investment. It's not, our clients are all over the world. We have had clients in Southeast Asia and in India, um, in UK now. So, you know, we are, we are a global company and I, I, attracting in, and investments are these days also global. So I don't think that's an issue. Here's another question for you, and please continue to type in your questions. Um, do you think obtaining an MBA has helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? Yes, um, quite a bit. Um, it, first of all, it gave me a lot of confidence on my own to go ahead and do this. I would be completely lost. Um, and getting an MBA, is, as much as it is about learning new um, subjects and learning new skills, it is also about networking again. Uh, I learned so much. Again, my class was a much older class than your regular MBA. I think the average age of my class, because I was in an uh, executive MBA program, was I think about 41. And so I think as much as it was about learning from my professors, it was also about connecting with my um, my cohort and my classmates and people above me, people um, you know in, in the class under me. So you know it's it's a big network. In fact, one of the first people that I mentioned that I was moving to Minnesota is my good friend who runs uh, UEL, who's director of UEL, uh, Diane Rucker. And so you know, so she was like, "Oh yeah, come come to Minnesota and let's chat." And so. You know, so it's, it, your network is always, again, I keep going back to the same thing, your network, and it's a give and take relationship. It, you can, you know, you have to give and you have, you know, and then only then you can expect maybe to get something back, but you have, you know, so you have to build your network. So um, here's another question for you. Um, when you're looking to um, hire, what skill sets, talents are you looking, do you think you'll be looking for um, when you're ready to scale? 
Yeah, so ready to scale. It, 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 it's almost like my investor, potential investor is asking this question. So who was your first hire? Um, so I like to, so during this journey, I also realize a lot of things about myself. Uh, I mean, I have been doing science and I, I speak the language of science and, you know, but the other thing that I've learned about myself is I love um, talking to people and doing business development and everything that we've done at Canomics so far has been word of mouth and organic growth. And that's how we have gotten clients by me going around everywhere and pitching and, you know, um, starting conversations and networking. So I love biz development. And um, while I can do the science and um, my co-founder Manoj can do the science, we, that would be one of the first people because we will be setting up a lab in Rochester and we would be hiring somebody you know, uh, from scientific background. Uh, eventually we will have to have a sales force, et cetera, as we grow and as we scale up. But one of the first couple of hires would be, one would be maybe even helping me with this dev, but also, um, also somebody who's gonna help me um, operations and running a lab. So that fits in into the Mayo profile of people and some of the profile, some of the people I see here. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you. One of the first things they tell you, like when you take a lot of lean startup classes um, is, you know, thinking about your personal life and um, talking about navigating risk with your spouse. Um, you know, what, <laughs> what advice do you have for people who are thinking about a startup or maybe in the beginning stages of a startup and what's kind of what's part of a useful com or a productive conversation with your spouse and talking about risk, um, talking about balancing everybody's um, values? So balancing, I don't know how uh, to do that. I just, you know, I just take up a lot of stuff of my plate. For example, I was, um, the day I accepted my um, MBA um, class position, I, I found out I was pregnant and I still decided to go ahead with it. So that was kind of um, tricky time for us as a family. My husband was still in training. But one of the things that, uh, you know, that's also really important is, um, you know, where you are in your life, right? I definitely missed the boat of the 20 year old starting a company where you don't have many responsibilities. And uh, most of the time, not all the time, a lot of times people do have responsibilities, even uh, young people. But, you know, so I miss, definitely miss that board. So now I'm on the sort of the other end. And, um, you know, you always look at when, when I go sometimes pitch, I find, you know, 23 year olds pitching against, you know, against me. But I think I also bring a lot of wisdom and experience to the table. But the conversation that I had with my, my husband was that, you know, he was in a long term training and he's a, you know, he's an ICU trained doctor. He's a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. He's a foreign graduate from Germany and all of that. So his, his extended training, I think we counted from medical school to when he was done, got his first job, which was last year, was I think 17 years or something like that. So that was a long haul. But up until that, you know, I supported him. Uh, one of the things we did, and, you know, this is a very practical advice is that we we, I did get loans for my MBA, but other than that, we, le we led a very simple life. We didn't, you know, take on too many uh, debts or we, and, and I, I do the same thing with the company, unless you know that there's a uh, definite ROI on it, don't, don't go ahead and spend. We didn't buy big, and once he was done with training, we didn't buy big fancy cars or we didn't, you know, buy the biggest house on the block, et cetera. So I think you have to have that conversation with your spouse and, you know, where you are and what stage of life you are and, you know, what kind of lifestyle you want to lead. And so, of course, you know, um, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be happy, right? And, uh, you know, maybe a big house makes you happy or maybe, uh, an entrepreneurial gig that doesn't pay you makes you happy. So <laughs> I chose the latter, but you know, it's, it's all about growing and, you know, and I always tell people that money will fall. If you follow your passion, money will follow. If you're doing the right thing, money will follow. So if, if your eye is on doing the right thing, doing it the right way, um, you know, everything else for success follows. But yeah, so now my husband is sort of uh, supporting the family. Now that we are here, so <laughs> I still have my I still have my uh, part time job with Harvard that also pays. So, so I think a big focus right now, obviously, is on COVID nineteen and how that's impacted businesses. So, can you talk a little bit about how is that um, how has COVID nineteen this pandemic affected you 
professionally and then on a personal level, how do you kind of manage your day during this time? Yeah, so I have two kids. Um, I'll talk first about personally. Um, I have two kids. My older one, she's self-sufficient. She's 23 years old, lives in Boston, works for Boston Children's Hospital. Um, she's doing well. My younger one is six years old. And as I mentioned before, my husband is an ICU doctor. So he's he's quite busy. He works long hours one week and the following week he has the time off. But now I have a six-year-old at home and it's been hard to manage, you know, his time and make sure that he gets the attention. And, you know, I am ha- I'm constantly on call. So um, he has video bombed some of my conferences and some of my meetings. Amanda saw me, you know, tell him, oh, this is that important meeting. You can't really come here right now, Richard. So he's figured, I think children are very smart and they understand. But, um, you know, uh, again, with my husband's job, I can't do much about it. So we just had to figure out um, you know, how to take care of ourselves. Um, and, uh, and as far as economics goes, we are actually in, a, you know, given this tragedy and everything that has happened around us, a lot of focus is on wellness and health and uh, economics. We, I'm getting so many calls and, I'm, and the reason I'm busy is because all of a sudden all these calls and all these emails started pouring in. Oh, can you help us do this? Can you help us, you know, okay, we are looking into this. Now we are looking into wellness. What is so, um, you know, at, for economics, we, um, we've gotten busy. Um, you know, there, there are potential customers. Um, there are new customers that will be signing up. Um, other than the supply chain being, you know, a little problematic, I don't think we, we were fortunate enough that, you know, we, we will survive it. But a couple of my investors called me right away. Hey, what do you think? How are we going to survive? I'm like, I think we are okay. And, you know, we will be okay. Our launch will be, of course, um, uh, delayed a little bit, but that's okay. I mean, given the situation. And then again, I'm going, sorry, jumping back to the personal side. Um, I used to um, do a little bit of amateur photography. So I picked up my camera again. I started taking pictures and moving from Boston to Rochester. Now I have a big backyard. I never had that in Boston, always lived in small condos. And so my son and I, you know, we started uh, putting bird feeders out and inviting birds in our garden and start, I started doing gardening. And so, you know, all those things have helped with the mental stress and it's an activity that my son and I, we do together. And, um, you know, he's very proud about it. We get to spend time together. We connect with the nature. So those things have really, you know, helped, um, helped us quite a bit. And then, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I have my bird feeder out in the yard too and seeing all the, all the interesting wildlife. That so, goes so, so one other thing I did was on social media, on my personal social media, I actually, cre- we started posting pictures of these birds and I um, started this group of uh, friendly visitors in your backyard and around your house. And I invited everybody and now it's become, you know, like everybody's posting all kinds of animals and birds from all around the world on that uh, Facebook page. So I barely post now, like maybe once in like two days, but everyone is, you know, like all my friends and their friends are posting on it. So that's kind of like fun activity. And then my son and I will go through all the pictures and we'll talk about the birds and, you know, the animals. So that's been fun too. Awesome. We'll do a final call for any questions. Um, Otherwise, we wanted to leave people with, something they could take away and kind of apply to their personal or professional life. And I know you wanted to talk about um, something to apply to to business development. Um, So what kind of tidbit did you want to leave everyone with today? Yeah, I think so the the most, and I I think we've already talked about this, but I think sign up for networking, go on Collider's website. They always have all kinds of interesting uh, information go on the DMC website, uh, go on Medical Alley website if you're in healthcare and sign up for, you know, now now it's, you know, everything is virtual, but, you know, still sign up, get to meet people, Uh, you know, as we have adapted through this whole phase of uh, virtual meetings and virtual, I think people are getting better at it and I've gotten better at it. Initially, I would be like, oh, should I put in a question? Will people even notice me? And so, no, just go ahead and do that. So networking is the most important thing. And if you have an idea, go talk to people, just, you know, people who may have done this. And where do you find these people? At these networking events. And so be deliberate about that. 
Um, and uh, the other thing I would suggest is that, you know, stay connected to, uh, even though you can't meet people in person, stay connected to your family. That has helped me a lot in, for your personal life. You know, reach out to friends you may have never reached out. Take up projects for your company, for your idea, for whatever it is that, you know, you've been just putting aside, like, I guess you can see the my camera in, in, in the back. Uh, you know, pick, do something that, you know, you've always put on the back uh, or you may have a really awesome idea and you're like, oh, maybe someday I'll get to it. Now is the time to do it. Think, start thinking about it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much to you, Lena, for, for doing this, for stepping up and, and being the first person to do the, this Inspirational Collisions talk with us today. We appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Tracy, for, you know, all the work that you guys do at Collider. And this, this, uh, I'm so happy. I'm so excited that this ecosystem is really flourishing and it, it, it's the moment for Rochester right now. So, you know, let's, let's make it a big thing. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. And I wanted to thank all of you who joined us here today on Zoom or on Facebook. Um, thanks for spending this last 45 minutes of your time with us. We know you could be doing anything else. Um, you'll be able to find this video again on um, the Collider YouTube page. It was live streamed on the Facebook, on the Collider Facebook page. So I'm sure we'll be able to save that and share it as well. Um, and we will put it out as a podcast as well. And we definitely welcome suggestions of Rochester entrepreneurs for upcoming Inspirational Collisions webinars. So thanks so much again for all of you being with us today. And let's enjoy the rest of our day. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day, everyone. <laughs>